Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the most important classical recording projects ever. And I mean ever of all time. You know, a couple of you have asked me, like, how big is this series going to be? I have no idea. I just want to be honest and tell you that from the beginning. We'll see where it goes. I would like to cover the most important classical recording projects ever. Projects, meaning multiple long-term things, not just individual discs. And this is repertoire-based, not artist-based. And I think that, frankly, um, you know, it would be foolish to decide in advance how many they're going to be. I did not want this to be like the top number X, like the top 25, because that means I have to leave things out. And I don't want to leave things out. It's as big as it's going to be. It's not going to be a hundred projects. You know, I, I can't say offhand how long it's going to be. It can't be all that long or else the idea of most important becomes meaningless, doesn't it? So it, it's, we're going to try and actually do what it says it is and we'll see how long it turns out to be. That's all I can say at this point. And I say that by way of introducing our next contestant. Yes, the Elgar edition. And one of you mentioned this, actually, and I think very wisely. Now, why is this so important? This is really interesting. This particular box, by the way, is uh, the complete electrical recordings of Elgar on nine CDs. Now, um, there are more. There are acoustic recordings as well, which were part of the other, the more expanded Elgar edition that EMI released previously. But these are important for a number of reasons. And actually, they have less to do with Elgar himself in a, in a, in a like, musical importance way. Because, let's face it, Elgar is not the most important composer out there. He's like no Bach. He's not really a big deal in that sense. He's only a really major composer in the UK. Everywhere else, he's, he's a Kleinmeister, a smaller master. But a master he was, let's not kid ourselves. He wrote some masterpieces. But the reasons for his limitations as a composer actually inure to his advantage as a recording artist. I mean, he wrote very little chamber music that anybody cares about. He wrote no operas. He wrote, um, you know, he wrote a small group a select group of orchestral works, just two symphonies, a handful of overtures and symphonic poems, a couple of concertos. That's his orchestral output. And then he wrote some large choral works. That's what he did. His range was rather limited and restricted. So it was manageable. Manageable at a time when the recording industry was in its infancy. Um, so these nine CDs would have been like a big stack of 78s. But still, you weren't looking at the output of somebody like, say, Bach, for example, which was you know, insane. Um, he was alive and could conduct his own music, which was really extraordinary. His music required the services of a conductor. The conductor could be the composer. And he was one of the very first composers to understand and accept and be interested in the technology of sound reproduction, of making records. That makes these important because they are the first major series of recordings in which a composer directs his own work. And that's really something. I mean, that's like a major deal. And they are a major deal. I mean, the sound is limited, of course, but the interpretations are useful um, because they offer the opportunity for the composer to tell us what he had in mind. Um, even if you can't really hear a lot of it, what you hear mostly is, is tempos. You don't hear dynamic range particularly. You don't hear balances in a realistic way. You hear tempos and phrasings primarily. You know, one of the things about, about these is that they are being used somewhat spuriously, in my view, as evidence of early performance practice. And they are um, early orchestral performance practice in the 1920s, going back to the 1920s, because these began after 1926, when electrical recordings happened, and they were made in the late 20s and early 30s. It's all a question of, of what you can hear, 
but you can legitimately hear. And so for things like, you know, vibrato, they're pretty worthless because you can't hear orchestral vibrato in modern recordings terribly well, and you certainly aren't going to hear them in these. Anyway, um, but for the other stuff, yes, it's useful. And here's what you get. You get symphony number one, you get fall staff, symphony number two, including some outtakes, um, bits of the dream of Gerontius, uh, let's see, the National Anthem, well, you bits of the music makers, the Enigma Variations, which he recorded several times, um, uh, the Violin Concerto with Yehudi Menuhin, that famous, famous recording with the young Yehudi Menuhin, who lived to, of course, do it all over again and teach us thereby that there, in that case, that the period instrument approach to vibrato is complete and utter bullshit, particularly as the Violin Concerto was written for Fritz Kreisler. Mm. The King of Vibrato. Anyway, um, the Wand of Youth, Suites 1 and 2, the Nursery Suite, the Severn Suite, the Crown of India Suite, one of the only performances where someone makes a difference between a tam-tam and a gong, which Elgar clearly differentiates in the score and at the end. Uh, let's see, we have the three Bavarian dances, the Chanson de Nuit, the Chanson de Matin, three characteristic pieces, Land of Hope and Glory, Yes, the Fantasian Fugue in C minor. That's Elgar orchestrating Bach. That is such a fabulous orchestration. I love that. Then we've got the overtures, Foissart. We have Cocaine from 1926. There's another one. There's a later one from 1933 or so. In the South, the interludes from Falstaff, Cello Concerto with Beatrice, Beatrice Harrison. And then we have, let's see, Beau Brummel, Minuet, Rosemary, Salute d'Amour, another minuet thing, the Serenade Fairleek, little bitty things, May Song, Carissima, and let's see, five piano improvisations, uh, Pomp and Circumstance marches one through five, Land of Hope and Glory, again. Then we have the Prelude to the Kingdom, Pomp and Circumstance marches numbers one, two, and four, the later recordings, these are from the 30s, when sonic technology improved from virtually unlistenable to marginally more virtually unlistenable. Anyway, and the second cocaine overture, and the serenade for strings, and the elegy. And these are all conducted by Elgar. And then what do we have here? Um, we have some, some appendices here with some other little, little other people, Collingwood, Hayden Wood, Ronald, Landon Ronald, and Hayden Wood, and, and yes. Anyway, so that's Elgar. Elgar doing Elgar in an Elgarian style, Elgarishly. He was very Elgarish, well, you know what I mean. So that's why this, is, this matters, because we have the composer doing his own stuff. And that was to become a, a it was still a fairly rare occurrence. I mean, the big one, the big, big, big one, which we're gonna talk about, it'll be in this series, of course, is the Stravinsky series on Columbia. And there were, there were a couple others as well. There was the Britain series on Decca. There were a few more, but not many. Why? Because not many composers were terribly good at playing their own music. Not many composers were capable of doing all of the things that they wrote or wrote things that were suited to what they were capable of doing. Let's put it that way, which Elgar sort of was. Although interestingly, you know, Fritz Kreisler didn't record the violin concerto because he didn't think Elgar was a good enough conductor for it. So there you go. But yeah, um, it was the first in a, a select series of really, really important recordings. And Fred Gaisberg, or whatever his name was at EMI or HMV in those days, or whatever it was called, was quite prescient in, in getting Elgar into the studio to do this. And he was a good sport. He did it. So good for him. It should never be out of print, by the way, because of its historical importance. And if you're an Elgarian for its musical interest, I think they're very interesting performances, by the way. Elgar was a persuasive advocate of his own music. And like most composers, which is very interesting, he tended not to moon over it too much. He liked to get on with it. His tempi are generally on the quick side um, and on the lean side. His sense of sonority was uh, put a premium on clarity and transparency to the extent we can hear any of that in these things. And there are some, you know, excerpts where he talks, where we sort of know what he was getting after. And so we can say this with reasonable confidence, a historical document of the first order and one of the most important recording projects ever undertaken. 
So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.